Well, I have to say, what a joy. Um, what an extraordinary celebration of what um, the princess at the end calls mutual exotic attraction, hospitality, play, performance, translation. Um, it's an extraordinary film, quite an extraordinary film. Um, and I wanted to ask you what led to it? Um, had it been a long time in the making? How did you come up with this extraordinary idea? I think I wanted to do it uh, already as a first film, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's ambitious. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, I was, uh, since my childhood, very fascinated by uh, Mongolia. And as a child, already I uh, learned uh, a little bit Mongolian, yeah, at least the words. And uh, I didn't know how to spell it, but I learned them. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, yeah, I had a great fascination. And what was, of course, in the beginning, uh, uh, from a certain uh, uh, naivete, I had uh, become with a uh, time a real interest and um, so I had read everything in the languages who were uh, available for me, uh, understandable for me and uh, so it started but uh, yeah. And I think, I mean, I wanted to ask you about the structure of the film. I'll, I'll come on in a minute to ask you a little bit more about Delphine Zeyrig and then perhaps open up, well, certainly open up to the audience. But um, it, it's, it has very much a two-part structure. So you have the opening, which is very enclosed. Um, it's a very carefully constructed, highly stylized studio set a lot of set piece performances. And then there's an act of violence, I suppose. The, 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 the warriors stop the train and abduct the women. Um, but then we open out into these bright landscapes, wide shots, extraordinarily spectacular, but also intimate scenes of an encounter. Um, I wonder, what, how did you come up with that two-part structure? And do you see it as a, a split or do you see it as a continuation? In a way, it's a mirror, yeah. And it is also a film about different kinds of narrations, yeah. And uh, different kinds of uh, entertainments. So in the first part, in the Trans-Siberian, you know, uh, historically, at that time, yeah, um, people were traveling in a hotel, yeah, through the wilderness, yeah, with all the comfort. Uh, of course, not the people in the third class, but in first and second class, it was like this. So it was like a, um, a wonderful first class uh, uh, hotel with everything, yeah, uh, with, uh, and then um, in the, uh, what I found uh, interesting, uh, this is then in the second part, uh, you, there is another time, there is uh, a time, an epic time, yeah, and it's an uh, epic narration of the um, uh, uh, Mongolians. So um, I uh, really, uh, after, um, uh, I found um, a little, um, in an old text, I found something uh, that um, around the 16th century in Mongolia, uh, there was a kind of uh, reform movement uh, like in uh, Europe, yeah, uh, in the religion. And so there was a split between the old red cap 
uh, Buddhists or Lamaists and the new. Uh, and it was really a kind of reformation, though before women and men were together in the monasteries. And then um, uh, only men could be there, yeah. And uh, I think it was a time after the great uh, wars uh, of the Mongolian. And then they were becoming monks, yeah. And the women were practically uh, um, alone. So they uh, traveled together and they made offerings. This was a little note I found. And from this I developed uh, the whole uh, uh, history. Yeah, and um, so uh, uh, I worked a lot about Asian dramaturgies in dance and music and uh, in narration and in uh, epics. And I found this very interesting. And I had read um, this in the rhythm of um, the form of uh, uh, narration of the, for in the form of the rhapsodes who are doing it uh, with the music and with the rhythm. And then uh, it was translated. And then the, I was able to find these uh, great singers, the old singers you have uh, in the film. And they brought it in their rhythm, yeah. So they were able to sing it in Mongolian, yeah. So, um, and I was told from an uh, ethnologue um, some years ago that they are still performing uh, this play, yeah. <laughs> so I found it very uh, uh, interesting, yeah. And I, I believe that you, um I mean, I'm very interested in your way of working in the two halves because um, the first half is very stylized and highly scripted, but I understand that you called for a staging of a festival. Um, so I wondered how much of the performance in the second half is, is yours, how much you shaped it, how much your narrative shaped it, and how much you released the story, as it were, into the hands of the performers? It's absolutely both, yeah. It's, of course, based on the uh, rituals. <coughs> and in fact, um, the, um, especially in Outer Mongolia, even the shamans had sometimes um, uh, Lamaist uh, uh, teachers, yeah. So uh, the two doctrines, yeah, were becoming very close to uh, uh, each other. And I worked about this uh, in a documentary I made shortly after uh, this film. I made the documentary later, yeah, and. Uh, uh, there, uh, you you can see is I have two real shamanistic seances. Of course, here the shaman is not a shaman; it is uh, a woman who is playing it. Yeah. So in um, uh, you know at that time they killed more than thirty or sixty thousand lamaistic um, uh, monks and uh, in socialistic times on both sides, yeah, in China and uh, in on the uh, Russian part in uh, outer, uh, who was f uh, influenced by by uh, uh, under the rule, uh, you can say under under the Russians. So and the shamans, of course, of also in the forties and fifties. And therefore, it was quite delicate to talk, but everybody knew about this tradition. But uh, people didn't like to talk, especially, you know, I couldn't go there alone. I had to go in Inner Mongolia with, uh, 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 with the Chinese, yeah, with the Chinese authorities. And it was a highly delicate diplomatic uh, Enterprise, yeah. <laughs> well, while we're on the subject of delicacy and diplomacy, you have Delphine Zerig, 
as a translator, an anthropologist, a translator, a, a fabulist in a way. She tells a lot of beautiful stories in her inimitable way. Um, I wonder, you talked right at the beginning, you paid tribute to the performers, including to Zerig. And I wonder, did you write the role for her? Because she's perfect for it. Um, but, but she, and she of course was herself multilingual. She worked across linguistic language divides, cultural divides. Did, did you write this role for her? And how, how did you work for, with her in the film? Uh, uh, we worked very closely. Uh, also, before I had taught her on the phone uh, everything, and uh, uh, and she really uh, wanted to go to Mongolia. She was very fascinated uh, uh, by this uh, by this uh, idea, and uh, so we worked very closely. Yeah? And. Um, uh, also in the other films yeah, before. And of course, I wrote the dialogues for her as I wrote the uh, dialogues because, you know, I knew all this, uh, the main actresses uh, very well. Uh, not Gillian Scalisi, yeah, the Broadway star, but Irm Hermann I knew very well. So, you know, of course, you write a dialogue uh, completely different for somebody like um, uh, Irm Hermann, yeah, who has always a little bit this dry and comical. Um, she is famous for this, and of course, Delphine Serik, uh, you could do this really sophisticated, <coughs> elegant, and uh, um, educated, um, uh, yeah. Yeah, of course, you have to do it in a completely different way, yeah. And then, um, um, you know, uh, sometimes, of course, in French, uh, uh, she polished also a little bit the, the French. So all this we discussed very closely. Okay, I, I do have other questions, but I'm sure there are people in the audience who are itching to ask some, so let's open it out for now. I might come back to some of my questions later, but do we have a roving mic? Um, there's a question at the back, and can I ask people to speak, um, in, to, to speak quite slowly, just so that, we get, so that we get the whole of the question? Um, hi, thank you very much for the beautiful film. Um, I wanted to ask about language and subtitling. Um, throughout the film, I felt that there was a sense of universality, especially when both German and French are spoken. And then there's this feeling that just people understand each other very well, but then most of um, German and French sentences were subtitled. I'm a Mandarin speaker myself, so when the Chinese characters talk on the train, I could understand it. But I was also aware that other people in the audience couldn't. So it felt to me that there's a kind of a moving of foreground and background. So when it's subtitled, whatever language it is, it feels like a foreground to me that everyone can access and also otherwise. So I'm, I'm just curious about your um, decision behind it. And I'm also aware that um, in films by Juliet and Staub, they leave um, bits unsubtitled, so that... They leave Staub and Juliet and Staub, they do, they leave parts of the films untitled. Yeah. Um, and by doing so, they wanted to leave or open up some kind of spaces, kind of poetic spaces. Yeah. And I'm just wondering if that's what you want to do um, as well. Yeah, um, you know, already the title is in five languages. The original title is Johanna, what means is a German, uh, uh, and uh, uh, like Giovanna in uh, Italian, uh, John, uh, and so on. Yeah, and uh, dark is the French, off is English, and Mongolia is Latin, yeah. So uh, uh, I already, this is a program 
already, yeah, of the film. And, uh, you know, I wanted to uh, create an atmosphere where all the people, what uh, we, uh, who are traveling or have a connection with different people. Uh, we all are talking in different languages and we have to understand each other. And this is something I wanted to create already in, the, in a different way uh, in the train, yeah, where everybody is, you know, you have the uh, uh, kind of, of uh, 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 funny thing of the Botwe, yeah, and then uh, you have the Yiddish, uh, yeah, but uh, he goes to Russia, but is born in the States and uh, uh, speaks Yiddish and not English, and, uh, you know, this is um, something I'm very interested in. And then we are going to, uh, 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 we have Chinese on the train, uh, we have um, uh, Mongolian, of course, and even different forms of Mongolian. You have the Turk Mongolian, you have the Khalkha, the classical uh, uh, Mongolian. And uh, I found it, fascinating, yeah, to bring all these languages together. And sometimes it's not necessary to translate. It's wonderful to have a little, a little secret, yeah. So the shaman who is playing at the train in the first part, yeah, he is showing here and here, and here, and so you understand this is medicine for the head and for the stomach and so on, yeah. And uh, I like also to work sometimes a little bit with these secrets, yeah. And of course, I, I would have, uh, 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 you know, even on the set we were speaking, in nine languages, and sometimes it was so difficult that I were dancing and playing the roles for the other because with the words we uh, 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 could no more uh, commu communicate, you know, with each uh, one. So the gestures were sometimes becoming important. And I think the film reflects all this. Yeah, but there is a need to understand each other. More questions? Uh, happy or it's not the answer for you? <laughs> um, what about subtitling? How did you decide what to be subtitled? How did you decide what should be subtitled? I, which is what you've just, you yeah. talked about the secret, I yeah. think, yeah. didn't you? Yeah. Some, t uh, some things are absolutely clear, yeah, and uh, without uh, translation. And others should <sighs> stay as something who is just foreign, yeah, and you can imagination, uh, have a, your imagination what it is. And you have Lady, Win is it Lady, Lady Windermere at the beginning? I was just looking at this quote. She says, must the imagination shun the encounter with reality or are they enamored of each other? Can they form an alliance? Yeah. And my sense is that you play also in the style of the film between the imaginary yeah. and and reality. You know, this first uh, sentence where I'm thinking about, um, um, you know, it was also in my uh, case, I, were, I had all these unbelievable books about Mongolia. I had uh, all the epics I knew, um, and I had seen all these great collections, you know, in worldwide, yeah, Mongolian collections. <coughs> and um, then what happened when you go for the first time to this country 
and then you see all the objects you have seen in a museum, uh, you have seen on photographs, uh, as costumes, and uh, there are a lot of things you start to understand then, yeah. And uh, what Lady Windermere is uh, about this encounter, saying in the beginning about this en encounter um, between your fantasy about another um, land, and uh, then when you um, uh, really uh, uh, see, uh, you encounter the reality. Yeah, this is a very interesting uh, process. Yeah, what becomes an amalgam, what even doesn't work, and other things are become becoming even stronger. And this is like in a classical opera. It is, uh, 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 in a way, the introduction yeah, to the whole film. Do we have? Yeah, there's a question towards the back. Yeah. You have an extraordinary group of performers um, who work in this, and it, it feels like the, the film can only be constructed around them. They can't be brought into to these parts as pre-existing um, things. So could you say a little about how you got together the, the performers for this film, this wonderful film? Uh, you mean uh, in uh, the Western actors or the both, uh, or the uh, Mongolians? Both. Both, I suppose. Both. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but, but yeah, yeah. Mm. I suppose partly I'm thinking of yeah, the fact yeah. that they sing yeah. songs, yeah. they they perform, they act in in various yeah. ways, and yeah. uh, it does doesn't feel like you can have a script and and just work and then bring people to it. It feels <coughs> like you have to have the people and work around them. So I was just wondering yeah. how it happened. Uh, yeah, uh, 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 of course, there was a very detailed script. If you would see um, my screenplays, yeah, they are at the same time enormous collections about another culture. Or <coughs> only my research on the Trans-Siberian, yeah, and the... Um, Old, um, I studied all the old plans of the wagon lit. Yeah, I'm sorry. <coughs> but um, for the Western uh, uh, actor, I were, uh, of course, I knew Delphine Serik. We had already done several films. I knew. Irm Hermann, I had worked uh, with her and knew her very well, and also some of the other actors, uh, Eichhorn, as, um, young um, uh, uh, adjutant, what you say, at, uh, yeah. And <coughs> then I found this wonderful uh, Georgian actor for the Russian officer. And uh, then uh, I were for a long time, I were looking for a young girl. Yeah. This was the uh, most difficult. Yeah. And um, I found it by chance. Uh, I was in Cannes and uh, saw her in another film. And she was then 15, I think, and she was becoming, in this time, 16, and she was coming with her mother and uh, uh, was on the trip. This was the most difficult. You know, she is not a great actress, but she is like, um, she reflects all the um, other actors, yeah? And this is, and she had just to be there, yeah. And this was something, also for me, an experience who was very interesting and unexpected. And then for the Mongolian, um, they are all by nature great performers, yeah, because 
their culture is like this, yeah. They have to perform, yeah, and they have to entertain the others. At that time, there were no such things at television. They cannot go to the opera or to the cinema in the evening uh, and all this. So they have to entertain themselves. And uh, so they are all fantastic and they can sing. You cannot believe they, in two days, they were singing uh, all the Broadway mel melodies yeah, from uh, the Mongolians. And so it, it was really, uh, I was so jealous because I never had time to be in the evening with them. Yeah, it was, must have been so fun. <laughs> I had always to work, yeah. But, um, I made two travels before to Mongolia uh, to find the people. And uh, you know the Chinese were very arrogant towards uh, minorities. And um, so it was for the Mongolian quite uh, astonishing that uh, somebody from a Western country were coming and told them that he wanted to do a film about their culture and I wanted to find the most interesting singers, the most interesting rap souls, the uh, and uh, uh, the best painter and uh, uh, the you know they have this wonderful spring festivals yeah where they are doing uh, this was a festival you talked about yeah uh, where where they are doing this wrestling and all kinds of different things and then you saw the um, uh, uh, lamas doing this um, um, this sculptures from do do is do taik Taik, as Do, yeah, from from Do, and uh, you know they, you saw they are all really very gifted, yeah, to to do things, and then I found an old uh, woman who were helping me with the rituals, so I could do them correctly, yeah, and uh, she brought all this wonderful old costumes and so we had also to build costumes of course so this um, and the Mongolians like to be together so when I had chosen somebody or two or three from a family and then we made this festival they were all coming and they bought all their herds with them yeah and so uh, you know it was always uh, 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 and uh, unbelievable coming together from all these people. So this is how I found uh, all the wonderful uh, actors. And only the princess uh, was an actress. All the others were no actors. Thank you, that's extraordinary. Um, I think we have perhaps about another eight minutes or so. There's a, there's a question here. Really, a very basic one. Why did they kidnap the women from the train? <laughs> uh, this is told in the uh, uh, epic, <laughs> yeah, uh, because uh, on uh, their uh, journey to the um, uh, monastery, uh, th at that time they had a lot of. Um, um, uh, you know, a um, uh, lot of uh, banden, what do you say, ben uh, uh, what do you call them? Of, uh, uh, what do you say in English? A uh, uh, lot of bandits, bandits yeah, yes, and taken uh, away all the horses and their jewelry and everything. And this is what uh, happened, yeah. And uh, so, uh, they wanted to get back their uh, all this kind of of things, yeah. But of course, this uh, is an excuse to show uh, all the other things. But uh, this is what I told you. Yeah, I I took it. Yeah, as an yeah. Hang, hang on, we need we Sorry. need the microphone. When you say at that time, yeah. when is 
that oh, time. This was, uh, I would say, uh, 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 since um, around the 19th century until uh, the 60s, yeah. There were a lot of uh, were groups of bandits, yeah, around, yeah. Another question at the back? So thank you for the wonderful film. Um, I just wondered um, if you had any challenges filming in such a open, vast space, any sort of um, climate issues or animals that might have been challenging to deal with? Uh, uh, of course, you know, uh, uh, when you are in the desert, uh, uh, sometimes, uh, um, you know, I remember uh, uh, all the, uh, uh, you know, we had, uh, um, for we had uh, uh, seven uh, women who had always to be, um, uh, 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 the maquillage and their hairdressers, everything uh, had to be done. And then we were just finished and then the Mongolian were coming and said, you know, uh, our animals are thirsty, we have to leave and we come back in the evening, yeah. So, you know, this, uh, you had to accept it, yeah, and... Uh, uh, things like this uh, are happening, and then we discussed and said we should more closely uh, uh, see this uh, before or so. Or we had um, a, a, a terrible uh, thunderstorm, and we were just in this canyon, yeah, what you see in the beginning of the uh, desert, we were in this canyon. And uh, we know when water is coming, this will the canyon will fill up. Yeah, so this was a very dangerous uh, uh, situation, and fortunately we could flee uh, uh, into a monastery who was higher. Yeah, but uh, it was a very dangerous situation. And then you know this is Hollywood would not take this kind of risks. Yeah, they would build streets to go there and everything. And, uh, but you have to work closely together with the Mongolians and follow their advices for, the, uh, for all the nature things. Yeah. And um, there were sometimes conflicts uh, with my uh, two German helpers who were also um, uh, because they didn't want to follow, but I had to force them. So, uh, you know, there, uh, it is difficult to have a big team and so many different cultures and many different wishes also. And, uh, but this is what you are doing and this is how you learn how uh, difficult it is, and gi it gives you a lot of ideas for the film at the same time about cultural misunderstandings, and they, in some cases, they are very productive, and in some cases, they are not so pleasant, yeah. And this is how you learn about this, yeah. It looked genuine to me. So um, was the um, bit where they um, gutted the sheep, um, obviously it wasn't, I assume it wasn't staged for the camera, um, but presumably they had, this was their standard way of slaughtering sheep, was it, um, in Mongolia? You remember the scene where they cut yeah, into the sheep sure, and sure, they put, course. and that, that presumably was genuine. It looked, it looked as if the sheep was genuinely being cut oh. open. Of course it was. This is called the White Death. And um, in older times there were, um, uh, there's, uh, uh, um, it is the way to uh, uh, kill 
uh, uh, animals, um, and you know they are. If you cut here, yeah, a little bit, and then you take the aorta, and they are immediately um, um, in in conscious, in unconscious, yeah. And uh, this is called the white death, and it is a ritual. And uh, uh, he was really somebody who could do it in a very professional way. And there's a story in, from the times of Genghis Khan, when one of his uh, great um, uh, uh, fighter uh, was terribly wounded and he asked for the white death, yeah, and because this uh, um, is not painful, yeah, and uh, uh, there were sometimes even uh, offerings of human beings, and this was also the white death, or uh, when a shaman um, becomes a shaman, they have to offering uh, some sheep, some horses, some camels, and then always this form of slaughtering uh, is uh, used. Thank you, but I think... Sorry. This is uh, a real, this is real, yeah. Mm -hmm. I think we have time for one more question. I actually wanted to ask about that very scene because um, I was rather surprised to see it in the Tate Modern this week because extracts of your film, including the title and that sheep slaughtering scene, are in the huge final room of the Nam June Pike exhibition, yeah. uh, which is called the Sistine yeah. Chapel. He, he has there. taken my film. He asked me a uh, long time ago and he uh, uh, asked me if he could use it, yeah? And I'm a big fan of Nam Chun Paik, and I said, you have carte blanche, take whatever you want. And this is what happened, yeah. <laughs> well, that's um, what I'm coming to know is a kind of characteristically generous gesture from Ulrike Ottinger. Um, thank you so much for coming, spending time with us answering in such a full way to all of these questions. So I'd like you to join me in saying thank you once again for a terrific film and a great discussion.